The Fuji Cast is an independent loading zone production. Eddie Michael from the the states sent some beer. Thank you, Eddie. Uh, did you know how much the beer was, by the way? Mm, <laughs> no, it's come from Red Rock Brewery, which yeah. I think is a Devon-based brewery. Well, um, he was originally going to send it from a micro brewery in the Charlottesville area, mm. but um, in the it was going to cost three hundred and sixty-seven dollars postage. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why it would have. Uh, to ship a 12-pack. So you you got your six, I've got my six. Yep. And you managed to, to drink half yours last night. So, no, so, no, no. I, I managed to drink all mine. I managed to drink half of the whole collection. Oh, I thought you meant the three <laughs> of your six. You drank all six <laughs> yeah, of course in one sitting. Yeah, of course. So that's $183.50, <laughs> or would have been, of of beer. Uh, Kev, that's disgraceful. Plus import tax. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Eddie. That was very, very kind of you. Very kind and uh, very nice it was too. Yeah, was it? Well, I've, I've, uh, I've got mine. Where is mine? Mine is here. Look. Yeah. Un, undrunked. I, uh, I can very much recommend Red Rock Brewery. Yeah. Can you? And uh, Eddie Merkel. Um, I went to. Uh, we went to a brewery the other day actually to eat. Uh, there's one here called the West Berkshire Brewery. Have you ever heard of West Berkshire Breweries? Don't think so. Oh, it's. it's, it's uh, I don't think they're much of a. Uh, they we would have started out of a shed as a microbrewery. Mm. I went there and it's, it's. I think it's something like the sixth largest brewery now in the UK or something. Really? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I might have that bit wrong, but I was listening to somebody in the. Uh, I, th- I think it might have been my father-in-law saying, "Yeah, that it's." huge but it is huge mm. and it all came from just a tiny idea of somebody with a microbrewery once mm. and now it's like it's a massive restaurant it's a it's an outdoor farm it's a brewery it's become everything the fuji cast that's where we're going wrong you know kev we should have yeah. a brewery that's what we should have booze booze booze, booze cells yes um, anyway, welcome to the, the show. Uh, it's uh, your questions from our electronic mailbag. And of uh, course, now we've got the FujiCast private Facebook group that we've had for a... must be coming up for almost a year with that group, is it? Or it's maybe more than maybe that. Maybe longer, is it I longer? I think, yeah. Do you have it right from almost no. day three? No, we set it up. I think we probably set it up after about 15 episodes. Yeah. Well, we've got questions on that as well. You're very welcome to become a part of it. If you want to send a mail, though, the old-fashioned way is click at fujicast.co.uk. Welcome aboard those who don't don't shoot Fuji. You're very welcome here. Uh, club indulgence is uh, well, we we did <laughs> we we could do a, a shorter club indulgence this week, but we've decided we're we're dropping that for something that we'll uh, we'll reveal when we come to it. And um, and there's Kev's. What's your book of the week, Kev? It, I know it's underneath a load of keys. And, <laughs> uh, hold on a second. And just... your mask. I can't believe Kev came in here this morning with a mask. Uh, I'm going to paint a cross on the door. <laughs> yeah, this, what do you got? You can't be too sure these days. Yeah, oh, yeah. The rules change every five minutes. Yeah. Um, this week's book is Like You've Never Been Away by Paul Trevor. Right, okay, lovely. Beautiful book. And uh, also, of course, we have uh, we have an interview with... Uh, at the moment, I'm, I'm sort of rolling through the ex-photographers because we, we hadn't really done that, and I thought this was a great opportunity to do that for, for the autumn, maybe a bit of the winter. So today, a high flyer, Bjorn Murman, who flies an Airbus A380 and also is an ex-photographer in Dubai. Mm. What, what a life! He's almost <laughs> exactly the same as me. I'm an ex-photographer, <laughs> I drive a Kia Sportage, <laughs> and I live in Wiltshire. <laughs> Ah, but look at the stuff. Um, look at the stuff he photographs. I know it's amazing, isn't it? The I, ar- aerial stuff is incredible. I know, but and that's him, by the way, in this little. Uh, I think it's called a Piper Cub. Yeah. Um, and uh, he's, he's so he flies one of the largest aircraft in in the well. It is the largest passenger aircraft in the world. He's a captain, um, and uh, I think I offended him when I first spoke to him because uh-huh. I wasn't sure. And I said, "Are you a captain or a first officer?" <laughs> And uh, but he also flies these um, one of the smallest aircraft in the world. So from 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 the one in the middle to that one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Go. Did you see there was a program on TV on the BBC? I think it was, or yeah. it may have been something I'll be just famed on Netflix or something about mm. the the history of the seven four seven. No, didn't see that. Really interesting because yeah. in Kemble Airfields, just by us, we now have nine 
747s. Oh, and they, all waiting to be scrapped. They've all come to die. Yeah, oh, no. and and um, you can uh, if you're into aeroplanes and seeing them up up close, you can go onto the Campbell website and it'll tell you when they're when they're coming to arrive. Yeah. And you literally sit under the runway while these massive jumbo jets oh, a come bit in. Like that island, uh, St Martin, isn't it? Where you? Yeah, yeah, I think so. But this TV show was great. It was it was right from the beginning. Oh. Um, the 747 story and all the things that went wrong and the pilot. They had footage of the first ever test pilots and the engines exploding and this thing <laughs> called ever heard of flutter on an aeroplane uh, yeah i have a, a vibrations um uh, flutter's not good no flutter's when the wing, wings can break off yeah it begins to shake itself apart doesn't it they're going too fast basically yeah. they're going too fast for their altitude and yeah. for the, the wind speed levels and all that yeah. i get uh, flutter sometimes <laughs> yeah, I, I get flutter every time i get on an aeroplane uh, and uh it was great but uh, i was i was a little i was watching it thinking that's really really interesting yeah. but then they did spend quite a lot of time on air disasters during that program no probably not the right one to watch them. no i mean they have had their fair few the uh 747 they have indeed um, the, the awful one that was in tenerife that was terrible did yeah. they do, do that one they mentioned it and mm. one of the very first test flights they they got all the passengers on and they all sat there and they all all the passengers got off because they could smell burning and as they got off the engine blew up <laughs> that was before they even flew <laughs> When, when, you're, when you're waiting on an aircraft and somebody, uh, you know, the captain will say, oh, I, I, I've, I've got to have, employ the captain's voice. I did mean to ask beyond that, actually, whether that you go to special training school to, to get that captain's sort of <laughs> stay calm in a crisis voice. But, yeah. you know, when it comes across uh, and it's, yeah. uh, hello, he's cap speaking. We're just, just on the ground for a little bit longer. We seem to have a few technical problems. We'll soon get this sorted. We'll be up in the air thinking, I don't want a technical problem. Put me in the aeroplane next to this one, thanks very much. Yeah. And often it turns out to be just the toilets bunged up or something. Yeah, or one of the kettles is descaled or something <laughs> yeah. like that. Yeah, but th those are the moments to be uh, fr frank about the technical issue, not to make it sound like you're going to have flutter. Well, my, my, my friend DIY Dave used to fix these things. That was his, one of his jobs. Well, that he was does a, worry me. He was me. a 747 engineer. And DIY he, Dave doesn't exactly fill me with a lot of confidence, if that's his name. He, would tell, he tells some incredible stories does about he? those planes. Yeah, yeah. What, incredible. good or? Yeah, good, but sometimes funny. Like the things that they have to... No, not necessarily a little bit, sometimes maybe... Mm. Right. Um, but he, he like some of the stuff they'd have to fight, they'd have to get out of the uh, the tubes. Let's say the tubes from the loos. What various all kinds, all kinds of stuff. It's obvious that you don't put stuff down. I'd be too worried about anything down those things. Mm. Have you ever? No, I mean I couldn't do any, even on a long flight. <laughs> yeah, but it is not necessarily always human. Oh. All kinds of things. What? Yeah, they'd have to fix all that stuff, and y y you know he would. Uh, no wonder the captain's always saying there's a technical issue. People are stuffing stuff down <laughs> the loose. He gets he gets really sad when he goes past Campbell No because he can uh, see all of the the, the numbers on the planes and he knows which ones he worked on. Oh, it's like having a friend. Yeah, it's like going past your dead mate every day. Oh, Kev, that's horrible. On that note, we should probably get on with the show and your questions. Actually, just a, a very, very quick, um, if I may, uh, plug for Photography Daily. After you've listened to this show, I'm talking to Vincent Laferay, the uh, the amazing filmmaker that was the, the guy behind the um, the launch of the, uh, well, I suppose, really, he made the Canon 5D2 re really famous for, uh, for being a filming tool. But uh, he talks today about uh, his air, and since we're talking about air, um, his uh, air project above 12,000 feet above cities like um, London and New York. Incredible work. Uh, that's on Photography Daily, the uh, the podcast. But only after you've listened to the whole of this one, of course. Uh, so, questions, yes. Okay, first one's um, quite an important one, isn't it? In fact, first question, very important. First question is from Cludis. Right. <laughs> and this is the first ever question we've got from... Da, da, da. What? Patreon. No. Yeah. So we will say thank you to the new patrons soon. However, one of the perks, in fact, the only perk. <laughs> <laughs> don't you, don't is, you tell me off for not selling things well. Is, uh, you've jumped to the front. Is um, Yeah, you've jumped to the front. You've yeah. been bumped. Bumped to the front. So patron questions get bumped to the front. Go on then. And that's the way it is. And uh, Ludis, Cludis says, uh, actually, I have a very serious question. Both of you have kiddos that are not fully into photography. And also, it seems, like his kids. My kiddos, as he says, are less than enthusiastic when I break out the camera sometimes. How do you get them to participate when you're wanting to take pictures to commemorate the moment? 
Kaludis has got to be uh, in. It's got to be in New Zealand or Australia. Calling them kiddos, has not he? Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Uh, no, you meant, I call yeah. them kiddos sometimes. Do you, no, kiddlings, aren't they your ones? Kidlets. Oh, no, mine. I, I, I call mine the mullets. Oh, do you? The mullets. <laughs> the mullets. Kevin and the mullets. As a band. <laughs> uh, you, well, you've had more of this problem than me. Um, the youngest, my, my youngest, uh, Thomas, uh, our youngest, um, he's pretty good, actually. He just, you know, he goes into auto pose, loves it, sees a camera, pose, boom, mm. gone. Jack is like very, I want to see it first. I want power veto. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I, I, we did touch on this last week, I think, and it's I, it's it's an age thing, isn't it? I mean, when they were when they were little, they you can't do anything wrong for your kids then, can you? But it's yeah. uh, they just want to be excited and be with you and whatever. But yeah, as as they get older, it's getting a little bit more difficult. And I have tried giving both my kids cameras. I, mm. I remember giving Albie when I got the X one hundred V during the um during the lockdown. I said to him, "Do you want my X one hundred F, which is a very special X one hundred F?" You know, yeah. I said you can, you can have this. Yeah. I, I'll I'll put a strap on it, and I, you know, you can have it. it. It can be your gift from me. <sighs> can I have a voucher for Xbox instead, Dad? <laughs> He'd have been happier with a fifteen quid voucher for Fortnite than he would have been with your X one hundred F. By the way, I've got a very big bone to pick with you. Why is that? Well, actually, with your kids. Where Why? are they? <laughs> um, we've had to but get Albie a steering wheel. And, oh, and those I'm, feet pedal things. Oh, I'm so sorry. Well, actually, luckily, um, Gemma's dad found one on <laughs> local, oh, oh, local, local, whatever they call it. Yeah, local stuff. I thought for a minute you're going to say we found one. We went down the airport at Kemble and took one <laughs> off a of 747. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we got one, and uh, it's brand new, but it's uh, the yeah, it's still not cheap. No, but now, now of course it's like, uh, Dad, <laughs> how do you? What's gears? What's what's ABS mean? Uh, oh, like, have you not got the gear stick bit? Yeah, we've got paddles. It's got paddles for the gears. Oh, you know, they need... need yeah. Uh, yeah, don't. Just don't go there. <laughs> don't go there. He okay. really wants Flight Simulator as well, talking about Bjorn. And, All right. And, uh, well, that's a whole new level oh, of... Oh, I know. Mind you, I was, um, I was involved in that. Were you? Yeah, a long time ago. Yeah. I, I wrote part of the manual for Flight Sim 95. Did you? Yeah. I used to love that. Oh, I well, know. Yes, yes, I remember. Yeah. But now they've released a new flight simulator, and it's amazing. The entire the one, world yeah. is mapped. I know. You can fly over the House of Parliament, uh, and it looks like a block of flats. It's quite expensive, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's about 80 quid or something. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, um, so, yeah, it's it's. I think it, it becomes a little bit trickier with age. Yeah, it does. Uh, but, you know, just, just stick with it. And I, I, that's the way I'm trying to approach it. I'm trying to encourage the kids to be more into photography themselves and then they can understand mm. it more. And that's that's kind of the, the way we are now. When they're younger, great. When they're a little bit older, um, not so good. Rosa gets it, though, doesn't Rosa she? Rosa does, yeah, really? although she's a lot less likely for, to, for me to... She'll notice everything now when I'm taking pictures. And, does she? And she's got a little camera. She's got my old X-T30. Yeah. And uh, not X-T30. X30, yeah. and yes, she gets it, and she's you know it, it's fine. It's 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 not a drama. I just I don't think they're going to be writing on their websites. Photography started for me when my dad handed me <laughs> well, an X100F. Well, no, not the X100F. No. no, our Thomas actually wants a camera for Christmas. He's decided. Yeah. Um, he wants a Canon. Does he? Yeah, he needs <laughs> very specific about the one he wants. Why is that? Do you think? Um. Has he got a Canon photocopier in school? No, no. It's what all the other because he loves his trains, doesn't it? Doesn't he? Uh, so there's a particular influencer, right? Um, who uses this Canon? Yeah. So it's all about what the influencer uses. Yeah. So I mean, he sees all my my Fuji stuff, and I've got my Nikon, Nikon, Nikon um, uh, film camera. So he's seen all of these. So he's, he, all these cameras down here, but he's very specific that. The influencer's the one that he wants to follow, not yeah. Dad. It's funny that, isn't it? It's uh, my nephew's 16th birthday on the weekend, and, and I was talking to him a while back about he wants to he wants to get a camera for, I don't know what they call it, Tick Snitch or something, whatever that thing is. <laughs> Swift, Swift Nicks. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, what, you know, that thing where they, they do stuff. And he... Um, and I, I was like, what, what one do you want? And then he showed me, and it was a Canon something or other right, with, yeah. with you know, like, and it's for vlogging and various things. And I was like, well, I, you know, I can, I can, I can let you know what I use, and yeah. you know, maybe help you out. Do you mean TikTok, by the way? Tick switch. Yeah, that's it. TikTok. What's the other thing then? There's another one. Oh, Snifter. Um, Snifter? no, Twitch. Twitch. That's it. Snifter. <laughs> 
bitch. I knew it was something to do with the nose. Oh, dear. <laughs> you remember Snifter? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm banging, man. <laughs> oh, uh, I should dear. know TikTok because Glasgow Lee constantly sends me clips of it yeah um, well it's it's donald's favorite don't be rude <laughs> oh, i thought it was sorry it's the other one is it but yeah, yeah are, you a, are you a member of, of uh, snick snops <laughs> god uh, uh, i don't know, i can't keep up with all this stuff but yes so uh, funny that isn't it canon yeah. um not that they're bad cameras of course would be very good for him i'm sure no i'm absolutely but I'm, I'm just pleased he's into it that's a good thing yeah Right, here we go. This one's from uh, Leon Droby from um, Uxbridge. The one in Massachusetts, not the one that's in the UK. I was going to say, I lived in Uxbridge for a while. Not this one. No, I didn't. No. Uh, One question, one comment. Oh, stand by. Do you want to go question first or comment? Uh, Let's go comment. Right. It's for you, actually. Oh. Kevin, ever since the first episode, your Velcro phobia has been keeping me up at night. (laughs) It's just not fair. Damn it. How can one expect a man in this day and age to live without Velcro? <laughs> well, I might just have the solution for you. Tenba, which is the um, messenger bag, the well, yeah, camera bag company. Yeah. Bags, yeah. So they have a, a messenger bag called DNA, and they have a quiet whisper hook closure. It looks like regular Velcro, smells like regular Velcro. It even tastes like regular Velcro, <laughs> but it's not regular Velcro. You pull out, You pull it out to open. And it'll make sort of a, a, a trademark, loud, obnoxious Velcro sound. You're, are you really not that good with Velcro? Hate Velcro. Is, is it like, is it what, a kind of scratching fingernails down a it's, chalkboard thing for it's you? It's that. Or? It's the noise. It's it. There must be an easier way to partition camera bags than using Velcro. Yeah. Well, I have used. Now I haven't had it. I, I swear it's not a timber bag that I've used this on. I, I, it must be on another bag. That doesn't. Um, Think Tank have something similar, a quiet opener on it. Uh, Think Tank did have this like soft, maybe that's what Temba have. It's like a soft, um, soft release Velcro or something. Yeah. So but you pull it down and then down and out to open, and it's silent, completely silent. It's pointless. Uh, just <laughs> Why put, is that pointless? Just put it all in a carry bag. Put it all in a carry bag. It's Velcro that you can use, Kev. It's good enough for Jane Bow, and it's good enough for me. <laughs> well, look. I mean, this one. What does this do for you, Kev? That's it. I'm going to go and join the Fuji Love podcast. I'm done. They don't do Velcro tests. <laughs> so yeah, so there is uh, there's something available for you um, if uh, if you wish. I didn't realise you had forgotten that you had that. I've got an entire with. top of a cupboard full of camera bags, all with the Velcro tape. They're all just up there in in mm. in anger. I'll all just right. throw them up there in anger. Because they have Velcro on them. <laughs> just hate them all. There aren't many bags that don't have Velcro. Well, my my little um, my mean, Magnum oh, bag This didn't. is why you get rid of your dividers. Yeah. Because they're all Velcro. Yeah, that's why they all go. Uh, is that the reason? Yeah. Yeah, why, did you, why else did you think it was? I just thought you didn't like things to be organised. <laughs> <laughs> ah. uh. Oh, okay. Right, question. It has to do with Squarespace. I've been using their website templates for the last couple of years. It's been my online shoebox full of photos in the back of the closet. I went the other day to tidy it up. And when I did, I found out they had a whole new release, 7.1. Mine was made with 7.0. Mm. Then we talked about this of late. Mm. Um, between us two, never mind on the show. Now, mm. while there's nothing mine can't do that I want it to do, that I know of, is there anything in 7.1 that's worth upgrading for? It would mean picking a new template and pretty much rebuilding all over again. Uh, yeah, so it, it's a big issue for people who want to move from 7 to 7.1 in that yeah. you can't just press a button and go, I'm now on 7.1. Although mm-hmm. I do think Squarespace are working on something like that. Uh, yeah, so you've got a... Uh, so you can just go, boom, yeah. da I didn't understand why they didn't from day one. I would have thought that um, would have been... Well, it's a very different paradigm. It's it's a, like everything is different. So mm-hmm. okay. it's uh, it's not based on templates. So it's no. just everything is blocks. You start with a, a layout, if you like, that's a predefined layout that they've done in 7.1, whereas in 7 you actually pick a template that you have to stick to. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's a difference. It's faster, it's quicker. There's there's new features. Um, so, well, anything that comes out at seven point one is faster online. You mean? Yeah. So better it's, being. It's better. It's to be more optimized. By. It's oh, more okay. optimized. Yeah. Various things like that. Do you know that. why? It's, uh, what, uh, they've just cleaned out a whole load of code, right, okay. a whole load of legacy code that they don't need, uh, stuff like that. It's it's. I would say if you've got the time to do it and it's not going to impact your business, do it. Mm. Yeah, do it. 
it's a good time to good opportunity to freshen things up as well i did all mine and yeah i i, I actually really like it so for those that haven't heard because we did do an episode about this during the lockdown we did for those that, that maybe didn't hear that episode the advantage between having well the wordpress advantage was always it was speed the fact that google um, seems to be more friendly towards it uh, are all those things now gone is it just not relevant anymore well no i mean there are still differences you've got more control in wordpress for sure but it introduces a lot more risk so for example wordpress recently they updated to i think it's 5.1 yeah caused all kinds of issues well it closed down my contact form (laughs) yeah because the j it's it's a technical thing but it's jquery went 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 pop all sorts of things plugins don't work on my yeah my old wordpress and i can't update it without doing the whole site all over again yeah so i'm i'm going to squarespace yeah exactly so and and we're not we're not sponsored by squarespace no sadly uh but nice uh, yeah would be nice the um yeah so uh, for me i was talking to somebody yesterday and uh you know he was like why you know what do you feel about squarespace and i was like you know what i actually enjoy doing it i actually I do, enjoy yeah. logging onto my website uh, i'm controlled by their boundaries which is great i don't have to worry about the design i don't have to worry about how things look it will just work mm. i can't and also i can't can't break tweak it tweak it within an inch of my life oh, i see yeah is that what you would you yeah, used with, to do a lot of wordpress that, you? you do you just go down yeah. a rabbit hole yeah, and yeah. then you can get yourself in trouble or it can be much better for you but there, technically there's nothing you can't do in mm. wordpress that you can't do in squarespace and vice versa um some things are easier to do in one and not in the other so you know your mileage some, may some, vary some design things are harder aren't they yeah I, you're you're more limited in terms of the look mm. for sure because i wanted to do something i wanted to change the design of my yeah my wedding one, it, they are kind of tied to the menu at the top and the and the mm-hmm. logo in the middle kind of routine, aren't they? Now I think, uh, and, unless you, well, you, my logo's on the left. Oh yeah, I mean you can move your logo around, but if you wanted like a whole menu system to go down the oh, left, yeah, yeah, instead yeah, of, there are certain it's certain hard design to do that, constraints. It, it would yeah, seem. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, they are I anyway, it it, it really doesn't matter which one you use, but you need to uh, you understand which one works for you. If you're starting a fret, well, what would you do for Leon then? Would you would you suggest changing over? Yeah. Yeah, you would. I would, yeah. But it's a big job. I'm yeah. th- what I would say is I would pop Squarespace a message and mm. say, "Look, you know, I I'm I'm happy to do it. Can you let me know if there will be in the future a mm. way of automating this this mm. migration?" they may say yeah we're planning on it might be in the next six months in which case you might wait otherwise just get on with it it depends on your time you know mm. I, I i like i liked i liked it i like doing it um yeah. they they do keep adding things as well squarespace which is nice so you can duplicate sites now you can duplicate content oh, can, so things. if you've got a site that you're happy with in terms of the way you've designed it yeah you can duplicate it so you what you copy paste essentially the the template yeah you wouldn't on, on your the- dashboard you just there's a little button that says duplicate and it says what do you want to call this new website and then it's a new can you version. apply that to a website you've already designed no it would be a brand it would be a, a new website okay yeah that would be handy because i'm just going through changing another one of the, yeah okay yeah so yeah i mean there's there's yeah mm. it's uh, i right. would just get on with it okay just do it your question and as nike would say just do it just do it this is from Andy Stonia, and yep. he says, if you can cast your mind back to shooting weddings for a moment. Uh, What's a wedding? I, yeah, I did my next-door neighbour's <laughs> wedding, actually. Yeah, yeah well, we both were the same really day, nice. didn't we? I was in Somerset, yeah. and you were in, where were you? Chippenham. Chippenham. <laughs> oh, you weren't far away, you just up, up rolled. <laughs> Chippenham. He says completely. I wasn't allowed in the registry office, though. Were you not? <laughs> no. <laughs> Cannot come in. Um, so I was only a couple of hours, but very nice. It was nice to, you know, to actually stick a camera to my eye yeah anyway andy goes on to say i wondered if you'd ever become distracted to over photograph then this is very interesting over photograph someone other than the bride and groom on the wedding day could they be super interesting gregarious mysterious jovial stylish then when you come to look at the edit you realize you need to delete a fair few so it doesn't look like you did this to the couple this yeah. always reminds me of love actually and uh, oh, the, the videographer yeah the, the brother was he the brother-in-law the, something or other and he the just, chap at the end that has the signs that, uh, that that declares his love to her yeah then he throws the signs away in the uh, in the snow and walks away and says 
enough because yeah. it's it was never going to be he was uh he was egg in teachers whatever his name is was he right yeah and uh anyway he he just constantly so he filmed the wedding yeah. but there was no footage apart from the ah, bride's face and then they watched it didn't they yeah and she was like oh, oh. and that's when the penny dropped yeah that he loved her yeah so um i reckon that's what andy's really after in this question oh, have right. you ever photographed a <laughs> man or woman right because you because you quite like them yeah because you were drawn to them. Yeah. Romantically. Yeah. I did, well, I didn't read the question like that, but... Uh, oh, well, no, that's not what he says, but that's what he means. Is that what he means? Yeah. Well, I was going to use the example of the Frenchman. Oh, <laughs> right, OK. Um, you know the one that almost filled my face? Oh, yeah. Do you remember the... Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I'm, I'm a member of a certain army brigade chap. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I just thought he was fascinating because he was... He just looked really cool. I was looking at him thinking, I'd like to be you. And and he was also very gregarious. He was playing to a crowd. Everybody loved him. So I found myself drawn to him because he was just really interesting to photograph. Until the moment he held me against the wall. Um, not in a romantic clinch, I might add. <laughs> uh, and uh, and threatened to, uh, to do rather nasty things to me because um, I wasn't allowed to photograph him because he was a member of some army. I, I, do you know, is it weird? I don't even want to say the... Uh, do you want me to say it? No, because he might be listening. Hmm. And I say, Neil, I told you not to say that. And he's going to come down and do it. I don't even... There's nothing wrong with Salvation Army. It's fine. <laughs> it nothing. certainly wasn't the Salvation Army. <laughs> but I remember that night going to the car and the videographer who I was working with, who had, he, he, he really nice chap, I worked with him a few times. He said, Neil, I'll walk you to your car. Make <laughs> sure nothing happens. <laughs> and he saw me off. <laughs> <laughs> Um, um, but no, but, it's an interesting question, Andy. Because but have you, you then? Have you? Have you? Well, uh, <laughs> so I mean, bear, bearing in mind, obviously, um, you know, Gemma might be listening. <laughs> well, um, careful. No. <laughs> no, 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 not that I can recall. I mean, of course, that you know. Hang on, you're going to be in trouble. Oh, you are. There are uh, there are times when people are more interesting, for sure. In what respect? Well, like my Frenchman with a beret yeah. and holding court. Yeah, and mm. you know, some people are just like supermodel looking for example and right. you feel like that might be good for your portfolio mm. sometimes right. I'm, I'm, have you got a shovel I'm, <laughs> i get this massive hole i need to get myself you can go all of. the way down to australia have you ever been to australia <laughs> uh yeah you know yeah. it happens of course it happens it does, but yeah. i've never i don't think i've ever sat down at a wedding and thought oh hang on there's not enough of of the right people here I've but i do i do of- get drawn to the 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 louder side of the room yeah the more gre- well the more gregarious side definitely because they're gonna make pictures aren't they yeah absolutely yeah more yeah. so than somebody drinking tea yeah yeah that's the trickiness to it isn't it really yeah, I, I can't was, think that um, I've ever. I did once have an email off a bride, a, f- a friend of a bride, saying mm. you didn't take a picture of my new dress. A friend of a bride. <gasps> yeah, at the wedding. Oh, I've had a very similar thing like that. Yeah, long time ago. This was a long time ago. This was in year two. Right. So mine was that I'd photographed. Uh, I'd made a picture in black and white, mm. where um, she and he actually had dressed up in particularly colourful clothes, I seem to remember. And, and I would have had a colour photograph of them at some stage, but there was one particular image that I presented. It was days I was shooting black and white. Sorry, days I was shooting JPEG, and I'd turned this to black and white, and there was no going back. And I, I got a complaint in about that, you know. Mm. But but yours is slightly different. It wasn't It wasn't. you didn't take a picture of me, you did not no. take a picture of my new dress. Yeah, it's like, well, well... Hang on, you didn't tell me it was your new dress for well, a start. There we go. That's and you were just a be. guest. Yeah. And uh, Well, you're never you just know. a guest, Kev. <laughs> oh, sorry. Do yes. another shovel. <laughs> Bring in the shovels. Uh, that's, uh, that is the final nail in my wedding photography business. <laughs> We've got a question about that, funnily enough, shut, coming up soon. Shut the door on shut the Shut the back door, definitely. Shut the back door. <laughs> Not the front door. <laughs> right, so uh, we've got a few people to thank, actually, before we go into this uh, this week's interview. You've got the names, Kev. No, oh, I have, You've indeed. got the power. Thank you so much to our inaugural, your new members of our new club, the inaugural patrons of our, uh, our little podcast. So for those of you that don't know what Patreon is, this is the way that we are trying to uh, keep things going, keep the steady ship afloat. Uh, Patreon.com Fujicast. Did you, you can... did you say ship? <laughs> Tommy Two-Tone. I, 
I'm going to take that machine off you. Um, I was getting in my flow then. That's the only thing I've got left, Kev. Don't take it away. <laughs> I don't have any work. Uh, 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 so uh, thank you so much to the following people. Yeah. We are going to anybody who does give us a, um, a little helping hand on Patreon will get a shout out. That's one of the promises. And so we have a, quite a long list here, which is great. Yeah. Um, so after I've read all these out, we're going to go to... Where we're going to go, Barbados. <laughs> Barbados. Uh, so we have uh, Michael Beecham, Dave Eskridge, yeah. Steve McClachan, yeah. HV, Terry Price, uh, Steve Lineham, Leon Lewis, Jonathan Clapton, Steve Pereira, Phil Turnbull, Murray McMillan, Edward. Hmm? Edward. Because actually, you can just have short names and nicknames. Don't you? have to give your name on no. Patreon. No. Kathy Myers, Alison yep. Barkley, Peter yep. Salisbury, Royal yep. Summers, Andy Stonia, James Souls, Lance Heggard. Cludis and Steve Johnson. Thank you so much. You well are done. our heroes. Heroes. Yes. Yes. Well done. Um, I got Albie a, uh, an extra potato this week for that. <laughs> Did really, he? He's really appreciative. Yeah. Well, now that you've been spending all the money on the <laughs> steering wheels and. Yeah. And, and and flying columns for his yeah. future flight sim. Oh, the steering wheel didn't work as well. It was heartbreaking. Wow. So he knew. Granddad had said, "I found this steering wheel." Yeah. And so we told him. Yeah. Uh, oh no! And, he, and then it he, didn't work. He was so excited going to school, mm. and he's not really very excited going to school generally. So he was really excited going to school, knowing it would be there when he got home. So he got home, yeah. all brand new in the box and everything. Oh, what you mean he hadn't set it up during the day to try and troubleshoot? Mm. I wasn't there. So oh. Gemma, Gemma, in fact, was setting it up, of course. Right. And uh, what happened was there was the, the USB breakout cable was missing in the box. Uh, it was heartbreaking. Yeah, and I bet, so I bet. we sorted it because we went down to the great little shop in, in Malmesbury called the Game Expert. And he is a game expert. He's and got he, everything he had, you ever needed. And he had the cable. Oh, I didn't know that. I was about to say, I bet you didn't find a shop like that in Malmesbury. But you have. You yeah, have exactly Game Expert. Well, yeah, well it's well just well like Miss and Murders. So, yeah. yes, sorted. Uh, why did I start talking about that again? Oh, yeah, the potato. Patreon, that was it. Yeah. <laughs> Bringing us all the way back to that. Patreon.com, Foodcast. Well done. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very much. Right, this week's interview. I think our guest across the next two episodes, Kev, is perhaps one of those perfect kind of jobs. You know those who sit in the category of, uh, boy, what would it be like to live in your shoes for a day kind of life? He's uh, an airline captain flying the biggest commercial airliner in the skies today, the Airbus A380. And he's a Fujifilm ex-photographer, part of the ambassadorial lineup. So he gets to travel the world in the best seat up front, and then when he gets there, make pictures in places that build the type of portfolio even one of those insta-influencer types would get envious of. Captain Bjorn Murman is our guest this week. Part one, from picking up a camera to joining the Fujifilm ranks to making street pictures the world over. Bjorn, before we really start, I'm, I'm going to try and paint a picture of your life as aviator first, photographer second... Although I'm not quite sure whether it goes the other way around sometimes. But I do love the quote on your website. Photography is the pause button of life. Apparently coined by Ty Holland, though the reality is I think he was first and best to SEO it. I don't think he said it first. But it, but it does suggest to me you're, you're a passionate stills man, not so much video. Exactly, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm almost 100% stills. Aviation kind of came first. You kind of hinted to, towards the flying thing. But uh, photography came quite a bit later, although I kind of I regularly uh, used, as, even as a, as a kid, these disposable film cameras and stuff, but nothing really serious. It was more just for fun. Well, you've been living in the United Arab Emirates for, for almost two decades now it's um so it's not perhaps the cultural shake-up these days that it must have been when you first lived there did, did you did you go there for the aviation or did you go there for the life and scenery change full stop no it was for the aviation i was i was flying in belgium where i'm from uh for a number of years mm. 10 years or something like that when my national airline basically went bankrupt and started looking for other adventures. And um, there was this place called Dubai, where there was kind of uh, most people had barely heard about it. It was just before it started booming. Um, came down here in 2002. We came down with a 10 year plan. We're just past 18 now, <laughs> and with, with still no real plans of, of going back. So, uh, 
uh, and on, and being in Dubai, obviously, that kind of stimulated probably the photography uh, mm. even more than than before. How's Dubai different now than it was then? Then it was obviously smaller scale. It was more personal. Now it's kind of has become such such a big city with with such a diverse population, which has always been since even twenty years ago. Um, but mainly, it's, it has become a little bit less personal. Uh, but on the other hand, obviously, big projects have kind of stimulated as well people coming here more for tourism um so yeah that uh, is kind of it has changed but some for the, like like all places like it's some some for the better some probably for the worst your your family are all aviators aren't they yeah does that mean they they're are, all yeah. airline pilots or no 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 they're not both mom and dad um uh, used to fly as well they actually stopped in the 70s now they stopped a number of years ago right um i was i was basically brought up at a small airport in belgium physically living on the airport no uh, way right okay <laughs> what did mom and dad do there then were they working at the airport yeah they were working at the airport they were kind of uh, running running a little uh, cafe next to it uh, partially responsible for a flying school things like this the small the small aviation stuff the yeah. real the real flying let's put it that way so so was dad uh, was he uh, an instructor then uh, no none of them were instructors but they they did just fly for fun they yeah. had they had their own airplane and since as far as I can remember, probably three or four years old, I, I spent uh, almost uh, every week in, yeah. in an airplane. It was actually interesting, just with, with the COVID-19 crisis here, I kind of came to the conclusion that it had been 40 years that I hadn't been in an airplane uh, that long, <laughs> wow. uh, which is, <laughs> is quite remarkable. I know you've got a small aircraft uh, at home in Belgium, although no home, I don't know where is home now. Um, having having been there for so long, do you have a small aircraft in the in the Emirates as well there at all? Or no, I don't have one in in the Emirates because it's it's relatively limited what you can do with a small aircraft right. here, uh, and it's bloody hot as well, especially yeah. now in, in the summer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, I have sm- I have a small vintage aircraft back home in Belgium. Um, yeah. Yeah. My wife has a pilot's license as well, so we often fly together. Um, where she flies and I'll take uh, aerial photography mainly. Yeah. That's, that's one of the main purposes we actually use it for in what, what, uh, Belgium. What's the small vintage aircraft that you've got? What's it called? Uh, it's called the Piper Cup. Um, 1954, it was built, flew for the Dutch Air Force. It's, oh, uh, wow, it has some real, yeah, real heritage. And, and it's fly a- it with, with the door open and kind of, <laughs> I mean, it's basically unobstructed uh, views of... Uh, of the ground. That's the air conditioning then, the, the door being open. Then, absolutely. <laughs> You've never been tempted to fly that back to uh, to Dubai at all? No, it would be a long trip. It would be doable, but yeah. uh, no, uh, it's probably going to stay there uh, for at least the foreseeable future. Do, do you, I mean, when it comes to relaxation, I, I'm, I'm wondering whether photography fits in then. Do you, do you relax by flying the Piper or by photographing? Because I know a, a few airline pi- uh, pilots or pilots, and and you're you you sort of you're rated on aircraft that you can throw around a little bit more, as, as you've just discussed. But but what becomes your hobby? Because uh, the pilots that I know, their hobby is very much their profession. It is to uh, to a big extent, uh, as I said, aviation came first. It probably still sits first, although it's often competing heavily with with the photography. So um, a lot of the photography I do is actually a mix of, of the two together, aerial photography being a typical example. Otherwise, as well, um, I still visit, uh, not now, obviously, but a fair amount of air shows all over the world. Yeah. Do quite a bit of photography there with, with the longer, longer lenses, your typical air show kind of photography, and then write for magazines and stuff, providing my own images. Um, that's, that's quite a big chunk of the photography work. So they always blend in. Uh, except for the street photography, there's always a link between mm. between both. Now, the, the street photography, is, you describe that as your real passion, don't you? Um, the aerial is, work yeah. is phenomenal. I would expect it to be with your with your experience and and the access you get to it. But why why is street your passion? I don't know. It's kind of it, it, Fujifilm was a big a big uh, push to actually picking up street photography, and like a lot of people shooting uh, shooting street. Um, we actually did it without even knowing it. I mean, if you would have asked me 15 years ago, what is street photography? I probably wouldn't know even. Um, so it was, it was mainly kind of started again, uh, traveling as an airline pilot, going to places like New York, Singapore, Tokyo, all these great places for street photography and just going for a walk 
often being jet lagged, you couldn't sleep in the middle of the night, you grab, grab a small camera, which I then had just picked up um, mid 2000s, yeah. my first kind of uh, X uh, um, camera, and, and just started documenting what, what I came across. Um, it was it all kind of, it, 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 it grew on me very natural, kind of. It's not that I kind of read something about street photography and, and that it was, okay, let's try and do this thing here. Now, it's, um, I was probably doing it for a number of years without even realizing. We should probably talk about that crossover between the DSLR period and the, uh, and, and the mirrorless, because there was a period where, where I think I read you, you, you pretty much put your camera down, to be honest, when, you know, with the larger DSLRs, you'd stop really using the camera, you weren't traveling with it anymore, which was a great yes. shame. Mm. But, but so how did that transition happen? I, I know that there was, there was a big expo, wasn't there? And I think it was Zach Arias that, that you met, wasn't it? It was Zach Arias, yeah. Um, I mean, to kind of go a little bit before that, yes, I had been shooting DSLRs for a number of years. Um, gradually upgrade like we all do kind of uh, always a little bit of gear heads although yeah. we, we sometimes try to deny it especially to our uh, other halves um, but um, so yeah I was regularly up upgrading my then Nikon DSLRs and I still remember the last Nikon I actually bought was a DH100 took it out had a look at it and said that looks pretty much similar to the previous edition the D700 obviously it's it's better and kind of but and it, after that moment that it was actually um, that was delivered, I barely actually used it. Yes, I did use it for a little bit of architectural uh, jobs I was doing here in Dubai, but taking it to Singapore and taking it to all these nice places uh, was just not the case anymore. Um, going back to, I believe it was in 2012, there is this great event, uh, Golf Photo Plus, which is organized once a year in Dubai, which is a big kind of photo kind of... Uh, convention if you want mm. with, with it's like, huge isn't it Ke this has become yeah. huge yeah kevin kevin has been there as well i believe um and zach arias was there he was presenting uh at night um for a big audience uh presenting the x100 how he actually what, what he thought about the camera and showing some work this talk was so inspiring to me that i basically uh, the next day rented uh, an X Pro One at that stage, which was relatively new as well. Um, returned the camera three days later after really loving it, and I just picked up an X E One then, uh, its smaller brother. Mm. And the rest is all history. So gradually, uh, the the Nikon's the DSLR stuff wasn't used as much anymore, and uh, eventually, two years later, sold everything. And since 2014, only shooting Fuji from that. I remember wrestling at first with the. Uh, I remember the X100 coming out. I've still got the X Pro One in a glass case behind me. Um, I wrestled with it for a while. Did did it doesn't sound like you had the same issues though. No, probably because as, um, I really use it in parallel initially to the bigger stuff. So I, I looked at it as purely a travel camera, almost like a compact camera, which I just throw in my pocket. This was mainly around the XE1. I've never owned the original X100, but it was it was similar as well. I still actually have it here as well in a cupboard, the XE1. It, it was slow to focus, especially with the older lenses, but it was just fun to use. And and the fact that it was so fun, so much fun, was 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 enough for me to convince me and gradually wait for the next models to come out. It was probably around the XT1 when that came out that I actually decided, okay, now it's good enough to get rid of my, my DSLR mm. stuff and, uh, and move on from where we are with, uh, with the X-Series. And, and with regard to travel, I, I, I'm not sure how, how much you're able to travel with in, in your job as a pilot, whether everything has to fit into one of those slightly larger briefcases that we see you chaps walking around with, or, or, whether, you, yeah. or whether you can actually take away a, a bag with you as, as well. I'm sure you're yeah. not. I'm sure you never have to face the the quandary that the rest of us mortal people have to, which was, I hope they don't stick my camera bag in the hold. That's that's <laughs> very true. Although it's still obviously, if we show up with a huge t uh, twenty kilo backpack, it's obviously not going to be appreciated neither. But uh, yes, using the small, and that was the main reason actually why uh, Fujifilm uh, the X series actually worked for me was the. the 
the fact that it's so compact and lightweight, yeah, we can we can we can take a small bag with us, uh, no issues there. Mm. A tripod, if that comes along for some night stuff, goes in uh, in the normal suitcase, and yeah. You're pretty much done. So, so how then did the uh, relationship with Fuji Film start? I, I, I mean, as you as an ex photographer now, I understand how you moved into the camera system, but then, then there was this opportunity to come on board within the ambassadorial scheme. Yeah, it was it was kind of um, like a lot of a lot of the ex photographers. I think some people still tend to think that uh, you can you can uh, pitch yourself towards Fuji Film, and that's how it works. Actually, it's 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 exactly the opposite. I went to New Zealand on a two uh, two week vacation actually not I mean not uh, for work just so purely and I grabbed this XC1 came back with some pretty amazing images for a small camera like this uh, it was picked up in the early days of um, I think it was through Twitter if I remember well I'm not even sure if, if Instagram was, uh, or if I was on Instagram at that stage, probably not. It was picked up. I was I was asked to kind of come in with Fujifilm Middle East um, and asked if I was, was interested in um, shooting a then brand new XE2, the new the new one basically that just had came uh, come out. Yeah. And it all started from there, basically. It was, it was all done very naturally, kind of. My blog, where I kind of at that stage reviewed some photo gear, uh, helped probably as well, kind of uh, having the visibility and, um, yeah. And, and the kind of work you were doing, because I know you describe yourself now as amateur, um, uh, in so much that you don't take money for it. <laughs> That's- yeah, exactly. I mean, once... Um, I can't remember where exactly I read it, but obviously there's the definition of amateur we all kind of uh, know, but yeah. there was it was kind of like an alternative definition of an amateur, an amateur being somebody who does something for the love of it rather mm. than for the money. Mm. And that's exactly how I find myself kind of, I mean, you can call it a professional amateur, which again, what does professional mean? Um, I kind of pretty much stopped, um, stopped shooting uh, paid jobs, mainly architectural work, uh, quite a number of years ago, seven, eight years ago, um, because, I mean, the biggest satisfaction I, I get is just shoot whatever I like, not, not having to, um, I mean, always kind of comply with what clients are, are demanding and uh, often struggling to get uh, being paid what you, you think you're worth, uh, to all, all these things kind of came into effect to make the decision to basically stay purely amateur. Um, and since then, I haven't enjoyed photography as much, actually. Um, mm. It's kind of, it's, uh, it's been very good so far. The fact that the personal projects are so important on the website, that shows me that you're, um, I'm, I'm trying to get this message across a lot now, that you think it's imperative that photographers really do explore themselves and their craft by making personal projects. Yeah, I think personal projects, it's, it's a typical, and, and I'm sure most professional kind of uh, people that, that shoot for a living, hopefully they will do some uh, personal work as well, some personal projects where they really can discover new things, where they, there's no consequences of making any errors. Um, often in my personal projects, it's, it's, it's also a mood kind of how I actually feel. Like obviously during the whole COVID-19 crisis, I think most of us, it's fair to say that we felt a little bit down um, through a, a potential of losing jobs, uh, losing, losing money, all, all these things. And that's kind of um, automatically that goes across in, in the kind of uh, personal work I'm, I'm doing. There was this things there like during the COVID, I shot a project called Left Behind, which was something that um, just was born out of going on a walk during the COVID kind of uh, quarantine here, which we were initially allowed to do very small walks around the neighborhood. Um, and coming to a construction site where recent heavy rains had, had, had uh, basically uh, started showing a lot, of, a lot of stuff that was left behind by workers kind of, and just documenting this, this, uh, this process with, with, an, with the X100V, which I was actually testing for Fujifilm at, at that stage, but there's nothing, nothing really to shoot. So there was a perfect kind of blend of, of, these, uh, of, of doing a review together with a personal project. And there's, there's quite a few other ones as well. Um, well, sideways i like that's i literally just taken out the right hand window of your car yeah and that is purely again it's it's it, it was again born out of necessity i mean in in dubai here it's obviously middle of summer it's 46 degrees as we um as we speak now 
Um, so obviously during the day, it's just too hot to go. But we, what we do do is often go on road trips. And um, what I wanted to actually show, because a lot of people recently have lost their jobs, uh, the streets are more empty than ever before, I guess, um, is is a project where I do shoot through the side of, of, uh, of the car window uh, with no human beings in the frame. Very different from the normal street photography, but it's, it's again, it's all about how I feel at, mm. at the moment, kind of. Uh, Do, does street photography have to change then in, in the Emirates? Uh, what, what are the rules like there? Because uh, as you travel around the world, you'll, you'll meet all sorts of different rules and regs and what you can and what you can't photograph and culturally what's acceptable. Yep. What's it like where, good, where you live? Good, good question. Um, generally speaking, it's very similar to what it is in France, although in France it's probably taken quite uh, a little bit more kind of neglected, the rules, I, I would say. Uh, officially, you're not allowed to shoot images of people that you can recognize. Um, it is very cultural, kind of dependent as well. Um, typically... Um, Photographing, especially ladies, the local ladies, the UE national ladies, we kind of, we always uh, will refrain from, from doing that. But then on the other hand, there's a huge population from, um, from the subcontinent, places like India, Pakistan, and these people just love to be kind of photographed. They often will kind of, uh, it's, it's like going to India, it's like going to Pakistan. So um, it's, you just respect, respect who you're photographing and you always keep that in mind. And then, I mean, over the, 10 years or so I've been shooting street photography here in Dubai. I've never had an issue because I, I shoot with respect. Um, and I think that's that's the way to go. Next week, part two picks up with a kind of kit Bjorn uses. And there's more, of course, about his travels and his work. And I should just say, and I wish I had your, your surname, Tom. I'm sure you'll tell me. But uh, although we knew of Bjorn, it's uh, a chap called Tom. Now, there's a title for a book who reminded me of just how interesting Bjorn's work is and, of course, um, his background too. So we do listen to your suggestions. Thank you. And I can't wait for part two next week. So back to the questions. Kev. OK, so this is, uh, this is an interesting question. Maybe you'll be able to answer this, Neil. This is from Don Ridgway. Oh, you're not going to give me a technical one, which uh, you know I can't answer. And he's from El Cajon in California, which is a suburb of San Diego. Oh, right. Mm, nice zoo there. There's nice zoo there. <laughs> That's the only thing people know about San Diego who live outside San Diego. Is have, there's a nice zoo there. Have you ever been to San Diego Zoo? No, I haven't been I to San... have. Have you? Yes. Oh, is it good? <laughs> I was desperately trying to fit my joke in about the dog. Were you? Yeah. Is this wise? It was a shih tzu. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, Kev. And I can't even edit that out because <laughs> the problem with editing that out is that then there'll be no context at all. Uh, Do you know, I must tell you this, uh, if we're allowed to use this. Look, if you've got kids in the car, usually you know me. I take everything out that's a bad word and replace it with a bouquet chicken or something. But... Uh, Jack has in our our place. Jack has um, has Jack. We call them Jackisms. He gets all the words wrong, <laughs> and he was talking about um, some uh, powerful car because he's into his cars. And he said, "Ah, oh, that's the one I want when I grow up." I said, "What's that one?" I said, "I want the Mashipbi." <laughs> the Mashipbi, darling. I don't think there is a car called a Mashipbi. Yeah, there is Mashipbi four by four. That's the one I want. I said. Do- do you mean Mitsubishi? <laughs> so now Mitsubishi in our place, whenever we go past the showroom, it's, uh, oh, look, there's, the, there's a lineup of Mashippies. <laughs> That's very funny. Very funny. Uh, so sorry about the language. That one can't be taken out. Yeah, that was a, that was a, a very, very special moment in the podcast where yeah. we've got the word, we got that rare word in about yeah. eight times in context. Usually, yeah, in context. Usually, I mean, that, that is that's there okay anyway don goes on <laughs> to say uh, lovely podcast gentlemen yada 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 and it's not a question as such oh. it's more of a point okay. a little bit of background i live in san diego but in my youth i lived in highgate for about nine months i worked in a fencing equipment factory near tottenham court road and right. studied fencing right. that went nowhere he says didn't have the athlete's body really what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is this is probably the the strangest like yeah, it's strangest introduction to uh, from Stranger Stranger Things. Dear dear Deirdre. Yeah. <laughs> In that factory, the radio was always turned on to wonderful Radio One, right. and I grew up to hate, deeply hate, right. Tony Blackburn. Oh, well, what did Tony no, Tony do to you? Also to hate deeply hate what yeah. Paul McCartney became in the seventies. Oh, but never mind. 
Anyway, Neil, are you the son of Tony Blackburn? <laughs> <laughs> I don't deeply hate or even mildly hate you, oh, but that not. resonant voice seems very familiar. Oh, yeah. Tell the truth. Come on, maybe you should do a Letters from the Love Lawn segment. <laughs> Love the show. I'm XT20, Don Ridgeway, Delante, oh, El Cajon, California, suburb of San Diego, where there is a very good zoo. The answer so is... So are you Tony no, Blackburn's son? Of course I'm not. I hope I don't... I mean, I, bless Tony, he's far more successful <laughs> than I ever was. Stop it. And of course he... Lo- well, he did. He launched Radio 1. That's not a bad claim to fame, Kev. Come on, let's give him a 10 point for that one. Mm. But I would say... I bet he hasn't got an email from San Diego no, sat on his desk no, right now. I'm sure that's that's true. I, I will say, though, that... No, no, I'm not is the answer. But because of that uh, programme last week that I appeared on where I did sort of Desert Island indie disky kind of thing... Um, there was a presenter that asked lots of questions. Yeah, there was something that came out there where my where my real name came out, wasn't yes. it? Yeah. So, so I mean, it's it's now public knowledge. Um, yes. So James, not many poor people got it though. I was I was commentating on the Facebook. Oh, should post. I just maybe no. not not say no. anything? Then? No. Oh, because I just had a great story about somebody who I I could be related to. Oh, okay, go on then. <laughs> but I should probably not say it, shouldn't I? Well, I was listening to that interview live. Yeah. And, uh, and I was... It is available, by the way, on, on Listen Back. Yeah, I know. And, <laughs> and uh, so if you're on the Facebook group, you can you can see it. And, and I was like, he's going to say his real name. He's going to say his real name. And then you said it. And I went, no, I didn't know there the, it is. The presenter said it. Boom. He said it. He gave it, yeah. But he had to because the context was that I was working for a radio station in the same area for the BBC as a commercial one. Mm. And the only reason I was allowed to do it is because I changed my name. So James Bartholomew is my real name. Mm-hmm. Neil James is the name that was given to me by by commercial radio and then BBC. James Bartholomew. Radio 1, uh, yeah. James Bartholomew. Well, yes, because the controller said, the day I got the job, he said, there's two things. You can't be called James Blackburn. <laughs> <laughs> We've already had one of those, that's enough. <laughs> no, but he said, you can't be called that because it sounds too prep school. <laughs> right, thanks very much. So he sent me down to McDonald's to think of a, a name in half an hour, okay? And, and the other thing was he, he banned me from wearing ties in the building ever again. <laughs> But um, that name, um, when I, I was at the local radio station before, where I was called James Bartholomew, one of the um, one of the uh, production assistants uh, was convinced that uh, that I was the son of Eric Bartholomew, who of course is Eric Morecambe. Oh, yeah. Well, you say of course. I didn't know that. Oh, right. So that was Eric Morecambe's name. Mm. Okay. And so for those in America that think it was Eric Morecambe, really popular, well, massive, massive comedian star. Yeah, he was in the two in, Ronnies, wasn't he? <laughs> no, that was Ronnie Corbett and Ronnie... Oh, yeah. What's his No, face? he was in Morecambe and Wise. M- Morecambe and Wise, yeah. <laughs> God, Kev. <laughs> and um, so, but instead of saying, no, 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 I thought it might be fun to play them along. So I played them along for quite a while. <laughs> and and the whole family, her whole family thought I was related to Eric Morecambe. And, but it just got really bad the day that I was invited to Christmas dinner. On the back of being Eric's son. <laughs> By that stage, I dug myself in so far. Hang on, I've got a shovel here. You can borrow it. <laughs> I couldn't say no. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, things we do. Uh, right, okay. Um, she fibbing. Oh, it's terrible, isn't it? She'd never do that. Right, should we have a question? Oh, Kevin Beecham. I'd be very grateful for some advice, please. Reading an article the other day about uh, combining bracketed images to balance highlights and shadows. I can't find an app that combines the three images. I'm shooting on an X100S and I'm bracketing for plus one to minus one. I don't own a PC or Mac. I do all my editing in Lightroom Mobile. Apologies if I've overlooked something, but I can't find a solution. We both use uh, Lightroom Mobile, don't we? I can't can't remember seeing anything that would help you there, to be honest. No, so what you need, you need something that's going to... In Lightroom Standard, you could probably use the um, HDR... You can highlight the three pictures, right-click, choose, create HDR. And what it does is it basically takes all three images and sticks them together. Right. Makes one using the different exposures. Yeah, I don't know in Lightroom that well. Mm, Don't know. Pass. Don't know. Mm. Um, I don't think you can. No, I don't. And I don't don't know of an app that can do it either. In in the later Fujifilm cameras, it will, I think... Oh, God. No, I, no, I need my shovel so back. Give me my shovel back. But I think in the later cameras... X100S, remember. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, it definitely doesn't do it in that because right. I wrote a book about that book. You did. I wrote a book about that I've camera. St- I've still got it in the loo. Yeah, that's my loo reading. Yeah, yeah, best place for it. Oh, we're, we're going right back to the. Uh, that's what was going down the loos in the seven four sevens. Obviously, your book. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. A, here's a picture of your book. Short and sweet. Sorry, Kev. There's uh, or Kevin. Kevin Beecham. There's uh, there's no answer for. Well, there is an answer, but it's not the one you want. 
Yes, sorry. Right, Kev. Uh, I have another question from Andy Stonia. We had one already from him, I think. But oh, anyway. he's allowed, but he's a patron, so he can get two in a show. Howling Bassett Photography, which I always what think a is a really name. cool name. Howling yeah. Bassett. Howling Bassett. Anyway, Andy says, uh, have either of you or your spouses given yourself a throw-in-the-towel date with regards <laughs> to being a wedding photographer? <laughs> uh, yeah, last March. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, we have seriously talked about this. I don't think... I don't think we've talked about this on the... We didn't have a chat about this during the lockdown, but we seriously did talk about it. Uh, are you on about you and I? or No, no, myself you, and yeah, Sam. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, as as yet, I'm, I'm aware I'm not quite yet married to you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so we we gave it... Um, um, I can't remember the date, some sort of arbitrary date that we put on it, which we came to and went by. Um, but... <laughs> but uh, yeah. Although I did peer the other day, the the um, uh, what, what's that uh, delivery? Is it D- DPD? DPD chap turned up and he opened the but he threw open the back doors. He was delivering something for us, and and I liked the look of the van. I thought, yeah, I, I think I could see myself working in this. Ah, uh, honestly, <laughs> I have always wanted to be a long distance lorry driver. Yeah, but that's not quite as easy as becoming a local delivery driver no, for true. DPD. Probably, true, I don't know. True, I don't know. They might, they might be well and truly oversubscribed at the moment. Well, they reckon Christmas time coming up to Christmas, mm. the online companies are going to be busier than ever. Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, well, we had a driver that was delivering stuff that said they were busier this period for lockdown than they've ever been at Christmas. Yeah, yeah. And my mate Postman Matt, he's he's having a, a torrid time, like post delivering well, in, stuff a good, in a good busy way. Well, he, yeah, he's just salaried, isn't he? So he doesn't yeah. like it. But but yes, I mean, it's good for those businesses, put it that yeah. way. Uh, yeah, I mean, I haven't... I, I certainly don't want to be photographing weddings when I'm, uh, you know, your age. <laughs> what? <laughs> no, when I'm... When I'm uh, don't be know. a cutie pie. <laughs> you deserve that one. Uh, I, it's not... I would never consider... I don't mind you saying that. I'm 48 now, so... yeah, You've I You've accelerated then, because you were only 42 a couple of weeks ago. No, was I... <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I, it, it depends who I'm speaking to, really. Um, I'm definitely 48. Or actually, it might be 47. Uh, 1973. That's a horrible thing, by the way, when you find out they're actually a year older than you thought you were. Yeah, I think mm. I'm 47. Right. Anyway, um, I, I don't really envisage myself at 65, no? you know, drawing a pension and, and thinking... Well, I'm, cl- I'm closer to that than you. Yeah, but... Well, I'm not in my 60s. Not though. that much, though. No, no. You're only a couple of years. Yeah. I, that's a long way away. It's still like 15 years or so for, for us. Generally. Although, although, and, and to, to get serious and, and very sober for a second, uh, we were talking about 9-11, of course, which uh, was um, mm. just before the weekend. And um, next year is the 20th anniversary of it. And I remember, because um, I, I was in Mija at, at that point, and I remember that, that... 20 years. Yeah, I remember that day, and I, I remember... Because we were doing some work for the uh, uh, um, for, for one of the tabloids at the time, and all sorts of security measures were put in place because of that. Yeah, um, I, I and, it, and it. I just I just remember it like yesterday. I remember the calls coming through and, and the the presentation uh, decisions that we had to make that day. And I just I even remember there was a particular guy I phoned in New York who'd offered himself up for interviews by certain uh, f- to certain media and. And uh, I, I almost remember the conversation. Well, I can. I can remember us talking about... Uh, uh, it was a breakfast story he had, a, a, a weird breakfast story. I just remember these weird things from that day, as if it were only last week. Ah, I do too. I was working in the city. I was in... You were, weren't you? I was yeah. in Canary... Not Canary Wharf. I was in... I was at Deutsche Bank in one London wall, mm. the new new building. Mm. And, of course, we had uh, Reuters TV live everywhere. It was just everywhere. And everybody yeah. just stopped, stared... And they sent the entire city was sent home because then the rumours started flying that you know the terrorists are coming to London. Yeah, they're in right. Canary Wharf. Yeah. So we all had to go home. Yeah. Um, you know, and yeah, I remember that. God, twenty years ago. I know. That's insane. Two thousand one. Insane. Two thousand twenty one. Horrible next, date. Next year, unbelievable. Um, so uh, why were we talking about that? Pensions. Oh yeah. Uh, so when is your throw in the towel? Day? I don't know. I let base. Let, let's be brutally honest about this, Andy. We are likely to be working for a very long time. Oh, there's no pension now. Just to pay off the debts. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. Uh, yeah. No. Um, no, I don't. I don't have a. I, I really don't want to be 
and, and not that I don't think I'll enjoy it, but I just mm. don't think you know. I feel like for for the style of photography that we do, and most people do actually at weddings, you need to be a little sprightly, don't you? You need to you need to be able to bend down and without well, holding do you say the, that, your back. But, I mean, and, I'm still a massive massive fan of Joe Busink. True. Now, yeah. Even though he does do some beautiful setup shots, mm. the stuff I like of his is the stuff he's still shooting, which is mm. which is reportage. Mm. Um, yeah, I don't think it's impossible. Who was that? That guy whose name I could never pronounce. That you like the Italian Mel de, de Mel de Giacomo. Thank you. That one. yeah, he's still going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. I wouldn't, I, I'm I wouldn't saying... describe Mel with with uh, all due respect, which is usually said by people that have no respect at all. But <laughs> I do mean it. Uh, that he's not the most sprightly character. No, he's not the same shape as um, no. Joe Busink. That's no. for sure. But yeah, uh, yeah. No, I mean, uh, pff, who knows? Do you know Joe Busink used to? I don't know if he still does swim the length of the bay just next i don't know where he lives but uh he, he i think is it la anyway he, he, no it can't be a word of it is he lives he swims the um the, the the breadth of the bay every single day oh yeah that's why he, he can do what he does then <laughs> he looks yeah. really yeah, yeah yeah but he didn't drink six beers last night no i don't think he probably did um but uh so no there isn't a throw in a, a towel date but uh i as i say i did look at the back of the dpd van the other day and thought oh, i could see mm. myself doing this kev has thought about long long distance lorry driving now yeah we could set up a haulage company kev we could kevin neil's haulage yes deliver him what beer <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't be a very good haulage company <laughs> let's just take a little break we only started five minutes ago <laughs> no you can't be doing that kev that would be yeah, against the law oh yeah Right, uh, Steve Pereira. Uh, oh, it's just a comment, but I do have a question as well from Craig after that. Guys, just a thank you note for bringing some humour and entertainment and education, <laughs> education every week. Um, so uh, I, I had to go and seek out Kevin Bridges if social media was a pub. I cried with laughter. Yeah. Keep it up. Yeah. Steve Pereira in, uh, in Petersfield, in the South Downs. There's not much Lovely that makes me howl with laughter, but yeah. that did. I, well, I did go and look it up after that. It took a bit of finding, actually. Yeah, yeah, because it's quite knuckle. It's quite close to knuckle, isn't it? Mm, well, a lot of his stuff is. Yeah, <laughs> true. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's very funny. Craig very W. Funny. Hi, Neil. Hi, Kev. Just wondering how you feel Fuji as a brand. Now, I did, uh, to be fair, in disclosure terms, uh, read this out on the Friday photo walk edition of Photography Daily. L not the Friday, just gone the Friday before. But I, well, I wasn't sure I was uh, perhaps the right person to ar ar answer it. So I said, look, I'll take this onto the Fuji cast as well. I'm just wondering how you feel Fuji as a brand is gaining more popularity. Um, well, let's, let's deal with that one first. The market share, um, I, I, notwithstanding pandemic, hmm. the market share went up quite considerably for Fujifilm, didn't it? I think it's gone up a little bit, yeah. I think, uh, you know, Canon, I think, are the big boys. Then I think Sony is kind of thereabouts mm. i think fuji nikon panasonic all of those other people are uh, you know as mm. much lower down the rankings than those two big big mm. companies yeah um the yeah i mean of course we we think they're popular because that's the circle we live in yes but some it's a bit people, like when you see a car that you're buying yeah before you didn't see them at yeah, all yeah exactly uh, yeah, like that, that famous sh machete. <laughs> That's what I was trying <laughs> to remember what you said. <laughs> the Dad, can we have a machete? <laughs> no, son, too quick for me. Machipi. Stick with the Kia. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I, it, listen, the whole industry is struggling. That's pandemic aside, it was struggling beforehand. Yeah, things are, are you know tricky for them mostly because of you're mobile talking phones. about photography is yeah. in general cameras, general. cameras. Yeah. yeah, generally, there's a lot of lot of stuff that they're they're struggling with i feel and that's like where do, where do they go with technology yeah. they've done a lot mm, you know you can't can't do too much more with that um what the, the struggle we all have with mobile phones and the what the fact that they're the they're taking over from cameras they're mean? they're better than no but than it's interesting wasn't it, that, you know my 10 year old should want a canon or not canon you know should should want a dslr well true yeah. for christmas yeah 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 i mean whatever i i i think it's a struggle for them all yeah. but yeah i think fujifilm is is put it this way right the x100 mm -hmm. is 10 years old yeah. in next year wow 10 years since the x100 the original team in japan in tokyo was that that run with that idea a lot of people didn't want that to, to go ahead i think and and the story is that they they kind of showed this camera at fotokina one year in a little glass box uh, and and it was it was basically a shell an empty shell and they were waiting to see they didn't have a technology inside it they were waiting to see what people thought of the look of it, it. it literally was an empty box 
and there was a lot of attention on it. So mm-hmm. then they thought, right, we better bit, we better make this camera. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> so they did. So in only ten, I think there was twenty one people in that team. Right, that's, that is really see a need, fill a need. There's uh, yeah, see a need, fill a need. There's um, there's not that many more of them now. Still, in fairness, the, the, that team, the, the core of that team is still there. Mm. And in ten short years, they have made the most phenomenal leaps. You They've bet. gone from mm. that X one hundred, that twelve megapixel X one hundred, to a hundred megapixel. Uh, medium format cameras GFX yeah. GFX all those lenses the technology that goes with it software the filming 10 the, the filming years capabilities. Yeah, yeah in 10 years yeah. uh, now granted the, the sensors inside the cameras come from Sony so you know that's that the market share for them is always going to be good mm. uh, well their business structure I should say so um, yeah I think I think they've done amazingly yeah, well yeah. in that short period of time but then so did lots of other companies mm. and you know we all know you look at the stories of like Kodak and IBM and things like that. You, if you get too too overconfident and don't keep up with market changes, then you will end up being like Kodak and IBM. Yeah. yeah. Well, he goes on to say, I've, I've only been shooting Fuji for six months and I've never looked back, but it seems more and more people are picking up a Fuji camera. I don't know how many times people have asked to hold the camera and look at the dials and such, which I think is still a thing, isn't it, when you go with that sort of, certainly with the X-Pro range. Mm. Do you think if they uh, got rid of the X-Trans sensor so the files could be easier to edit, more people might make that switch? Craig W. Now, I did put this to you, and you seemed a bit bemused by it. Well, I don't understand that, that point, to be honest with you. Easier to edit. I, I don't understand. I mean, the- Now, he was a Canon shooter, and I would agree with him that when editing RAW, the thing seems, or Lightroom seemed to whip through the Canon files much more... Like butter. What, it? quick, just speed-wise? Yes. Yeah, but that that was probably because the Canon systems you were using back in those days were smaller megapixels, smaller mm, smaller file sizes. 5D3. What was that? Well, easily the size of, of I don't remember, actually. Five, 18 megapixels. Should we look it up? Yeah, why not? Let's look it up. Well, uh, while you're looking that up, I, 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 uh, yeah, I have no problems. I... I have no problems with it. And, of course, I'm not just saying that because I'm a, an ambassador. Yeah. I genuinely don't. 22.3 megapixels. Okay, so, yeah, not too much difference in fairness. No, no, no. no. Um, but I, I don't think the X-Trans sensor has got anything to do with it. The X-Trans sensor is just a brand. of. It's like the Canon have their sensor yeah. brands. But there is a different way that the, the, the sensors work, though, isn't it? Well, it's got the Bayer the, filter. Yeah, and, yeah. and there's an uh, anti... What's anti, it called? The, a mosaicing um, yeah, anti, thing and that that's on. what the Bayer filter is basically for to yeah. to avoid the moire yeah moire 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 the fuzzy fuzzy bits you get on on uh, yeah <laughs> and you only ever see it on on certain suits <laughs> yeah usually bad ones <laughs> yeah the bad bad nylon suit yeah. filter <laughs> <laughs> that's it and the suits that television presenters wear <laughs> yeah so yeah I, I don't really have any problems but um I, I haven't used anything other than that for nearly 10 years or 10 mm. years. Mm. So I'm, I'm probably not the best person to, to ask. Yeah. But I, I don't know really know what the problems are. Right, books. Let's look at uh, now, which one have you brought in this week for us? That's okay. Kev's Book of the Week. Kev's Book of the Week. You've got a print with that. I have. I've got a signed print with it. Is it signed? Just, just realised. Well, wow, look at that. Paul T. Wow. So this is Paul Trevor, like you've never been away. And I guess the reason what I didn't... nice touch. I didn't remember this, but the reason why I probably have this as a signed print is because it's a Blue Coat Press book, which means uh-huh. I backed it on Kickstarter. Yes. Um, so in the back of some of these books, I don't know, they often put... There we go. The names of people... Oh, are you in there? Um... Kevin Mullins, there I am. Look, there I'm between go. I'm between John Murray and May Mulleroy. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so this book is um, full of black and white pictures, mostly of kind of the northwest and Liverpool and mm. areas like that. Uh, and it's that real gritty, like the front cover picture. I love it's. It looks like. I'm guessing this is like the 70s, but it's it, it's looking. Yeah, when you say those sort of post war, mi- those kind of misty shots of sort of triple and double layered um, housing of of that form. And and what what makes that picture interesting to you? So let me just describe. Well, it's a the huddle picture. of kids that look like yeah. they're wearing very 70s jumpers. Yeah, <laughs> 70s jumpers, 70s strides. Yes, but there's no clutter, is there? There's no cars. There's no. Oh, uh, there's no. Yeah. Um, uh, with the, those circular things that you have to get for Sky Sports satellite dishes satellite dishes yep. none of that it's all just functional yeah because in those days 
we lived by by only having the things that we needed for functioning. Yeah. Uh, there was no kind of um, well, uh, clutter. Pe- people like. didn't have two cars to a family for no, a start. Well, there's no. not, not one car in that scene. No, I know. Um, in fact, I'm looking at a few of the pictures here, and there's no cars at all. No, it's it's all in Liverpool. So it's all in that 70s time. And I think the story goes that he he had uh, he shot these pictures and they were picked up and I think he's created four books in all in, right. in the series yeah. but again it's you know it's it goes back to what we've always talked about and this idea of uh, legacy I suppose but mm. also of nostalgia mm. so we look at these pictures and so this one on um, page 107 Concord Close Everton uh, Liverpool 3 1975 mm-hmm. Five or six kids, all really, really happy, massive, great big grinning teeth, Mm -hmm. um, probably in very, very poor living conditions. But their kids being kids, playing, you know, being happy, guy with the camera. Uh, Hay Heights in Everton, 1975, the next page. Now that shows the inside of their their housing and... There's graffiti on the wall, and you know, but the kids are happy. I'm looking at the one uh, by by the sea here. It's beautiful, and and you know, and the thing is, it's often I feel like you know we think about these pictures as just snaps yeah. and, and unconsidered, and and I feel whenever I say that you know it's about nostalgia, yeah. I sometimes think I have to I have to I have to explain that what I, I, that doesn't mean that all pictures, regardless of what they are, are going to be nostalgic in the future. Mm. These still these pictures here in front of us are still well considered, well composed, mm. based on the core principles. You know the three core principles: light, composition, and moment. Simple as that. I love this one, page eighty five, Mozart Street in Toxteth. So there's a lady, uh, the two kids in the bath in the plastic yeah. bath thing in front of the living room fire, Fantastic. electric fire. She's got her towel wrapped around her head because yeah. she was uh, she's obviously first in the bath on a Sunday night. And then on the Not telly... Not in that bath, Kev. Have you seen the size of it? Well... It's only for two little nippers. Yeah, well, yeah. Maybe. Yeah. You never know. Maybe right. she just put her head in it. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but look at the telly. Can you see the telly? Yeah, it's proper old black and white sort of... Proper old black yeah. and white telly. But he's managed... You know, that would be a tricky thing to get right so with he, digital he's, photography. He's managed he's to managed get that exposure. Film. And uh, it's no video recorder, of course, or anything no, like that in no. those days. Great. Love it. Why do you think he called it like you'd never been away? I mean, it, it, uh, does, does it, does it, uh, there's probably a story. There's quite a lot of text at the beginning, so he, I mean, he probably came, does explain he it. He came to Liverpool as a member of the Exit Photography Group. Mm-hmm. Um, so he, he didn't necessarily grow up there. But I wonder, Paul stayed for six months photographing the hardships faced by people, particularly children, at a time of economic decline. So that, that backs up what you were saying, and social yeah. unrest as well. Mm. But um, I wonder if he means by that, if you return to this now, that you look at these streets and think, yeah, that's my Liverpool. Yeah, maybe, and uh, it's it's hard, isn't it? Because I I look at these pictures and and you think, oh, you know, we should be doing more of that around yeah. our area and stuff. And of course, and then you 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 fall down that trap, which is wrong, of thinking, yeah, but we're we're so lucky, we've got everything. You know, it's nothing to. N- n- there's no interesting photographs. Yeah. these were these weren't interesting scenes then. These were everyday scenes. Mm. These are interesting now because mm. they're different. And of course, now you have all of the issues with. You know, can you just rock up to a bunch of kids t- playing football and take a picture and say, "Yeah, uh, yeah it's all right." I, That'd this be a is very difficult. This is for a, a future now. project. Yeah, yeah. Which is in, makes what, me, mate? What are you talking about? Makes me desperately sad. Desperately sad. Yeah. But you know, it's it's just more, much more difficult, isn't it? Look at these kids in the in is the your um, nostalgia, shopping trolley. Is, it, yeah. <laughs> is your nostalgia <laughs> increased because it's black and white? Does that does that for you? I mean, if you were making photographs, if you were making these similar photographs now, taking away that awkwardness of photographing kids playing and all the rest of it, um, for obvious reasons, would that photograph have to be a black and white for you? I'm not so sure because I really love the Bob Mazur stuff on, on the underground, and that's mostly colour. Yeah, so I really love that too. Of a particular ca- a particular stock, of course, which does still dates it though. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, absolutely. You can tell it's film yeah, yeah. Um, for sure. Oh, I can love all this stuff. These little kids, Handel Street, Toxteth. Yeah. So if you're if you're a 1970s uh, Liverpudlian, mm-hmm. you're going to love this book, and you may well even be in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that's Matt, I'm sure that's Matt Hart there. <laughs> Look, yeah, yeah, I'm sure that's Matt Hart. No, don't be so daft. <laughs> so uh, like you've never been away. Always difficult talking about these books on I'll the tell podcast. You, that's a, that's a uh, you're going to be sitting down with nostalgia reading that, aren't you? It's beautiful, and yeah. um, yeah. we will. So well done. We will. Well, there was a comment on Twitter actually. Somebody said, uh, you know, if you're ever listening to the Fujicast. Yeah. 
make sure you stop and have a pen and paper ready because it's a nightmare because we are constantly <laughs> writing down names and books and everything and I, and I had to remind him we do have a website there are show notes there are show notes on the website with uh, everything so it's the shiny website that Kev designed during lockdown it is yeah um, anyway that's it that's it for another week thank you very much for uh, for being with us thank you to Bjorn Merman for, for being our guest he's back next week for part two by the way um, oh yeah, we'll of course return to our books next week and uh, if you're if you're becoming a, a patron member we should you should probably remind people what that's all about Kev so uh, so patron is uh, just for the price of a cup of coffee a month you can uh, you can help coffee. us uh, a cup of coffee or maybe a beer or whatever we're from department whatever part of the world you're in might be a little bit more expensive um, yes you will help us out uh, the, there are costs in running this podcast that we are trying to cover but you are not obliged do no. not feel obliged no nobody cares uh, if you uh, well my kids do do or don't <laughs> um, and, and Albie does because he wants that flight simulator yeah control panel he ain't gonna have it <laughs> thank you for your questions keep sending them in it's, uh, they are the lifeblood of the show they really do help this thing keep moving so uh, send them please you can either well, there's two ways to do it either via the uh, the Fujicast private Facebook group which you're very welcome to join and that seems to be growing nicely as well so please come on in the water is what, what do you say the water's nice water's good temper what do you say the water's warm the water's feels good water's nice yeah or you can send them to click at fujicast.co.uk and we'll be back next week bye 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 the fujicast is an independent loading zone production email the show with your questions and words of wisdom to click at fujicast.co.uk email any complaints and political nonsense to our wives who will deal with your comments in their own good time and in their own good way